March 16th, 2021 City Council Study Session in support of social distancing requirements and based on space limitations in our building, the city is limiting physical attendance at our public meetings to only essential staff, applic applicants and elected officials, and will continue to provide public access via electronic participation for members of our community. All attendees are required to wear face coverings when not speaking and maintain a six foot social distancing. The city will also imp implement symptom monitoring measures for attendees, such as temperature checks and completion of city's facilities health screening surveys before and Slide, please. Slide, please. Slide, please. And one more slide. Yeah, hang on. It, it, one of our council members is <laughs> touching his mic. Mike is attaching his mic. All right, slide, please. All right, slide, please. All right, slide, please. All right, slide, please. Oh my gosh. Is it April Fool's Day or St. Patrick's Day? What is happening with our sound? Day, yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. I put together a, a quick agenda um, just to give a quick overview um, on what I'll be covering tonight. So you'll receive an overview of the finance department, including the staffing, our responsibilities, our accomplishments last year and our goals for this year. Um, then a quick update on our outsourced audit process, as well as the state sales and use tax system update. And then finally, I will uh, brief you on the uh, fiscal year end of 2020. Slide, please. So this is our organizational chart of the finance department. So you can see um, the functions are all reporting up to our accounting manager, Heather Lundy. Um, so our staff is separated into our accounting technician, Caroline Medina, Liam Mai, who is our senior accountant, Gita, which all of you I'm sure know, our revenue and licensing clerk, as well as Joey Conrad, our newest addition, uh, who oversees the budget and revenue analyst function. Mm -hmm. So I did want to include on the next slide a fun picture that we took last year. So Joey was not included. This was the beginning of March celebrating 25 years of low trees. <laughs> I, I do want to include this. You're standing way too close together and without masks. <laughs> and no, so we knew it was, exactly knew it was <laughs> last year. <laughs> All right, slide please. So some of the day to day operations of the finance uh, department include payroll processing, mm -hmm. accounts payable, so di disbursements out. Uh, purchasing card oversight, and then incoming revenues, the accounts receivable process, deposit, deposit processing. We prepare the financial statements on a monthly basis, administer sales tax, um, and probably the two functions that I enjoy most is supporting and collaborating with other departments. We're in a unique department that we really do touch every other department, so I truly enjoy that. Um, as well as supporting our businesses in regards to tax return filings, business license uh, registrations, and just the day-to-day -day questions that come up from, from our community. Next slide, please. Other responsibilities include our annual tax filings. So we have 10, 1099s, W-2s, 1042s. We um, are in the midst of our audit, which is required by state statute. We oversee the sales and use tax audits, and I will give a brief update on that as well. Um, we assist with purchasing as well as contract assistance, any of our debt compliance, so um, the bond covenants that we have to follow, as well as um, providing information around projections, forecasting, as well as the annual budget process. All right, slide please. 2020 accomplishments. It's been quite a year, but I'm really proud um, of my team. I couldn't have asked for a better team. Their positive attitudes throughout the whole year um, really made this year still enjoyable. 
Um, and we still accomplished a lot, which um, a few highlights here are we updated the financial components of the operations manual, which has been shared with all of our staff. We cross trained, um, we completed our cross training manual. So all of our functions, we have at least one person that can do the functions for business continuity purposes. Very proud of the implementation of our digital expense report process. So our PCOT process has now been moved completely digital. Uh, so no more paper based process. And especially during last year, I think that has really paid off where staff can now or PCOT holders can now upload receipts directly into the system, um, either via an app on their phone or via computer. It then gets routed to their manager for approval who have full um, visibility now of the receipts that are uploaded and then for final processing to the finance department. Um, in addition to that, we kept council as well as city leadership and staff updated on the budget impacts of COVID-19, uh, which in, in the end resulted uh, in the budget amendment of 2020. Slide please. I was also part of a group uh, with the Douglas County Finance Directors, which we, we met on a weekly basis to discuss the CARES Act funding and, and potential uses of those funds. Um, and that was um, a very rewarding process and just having a lot of very smart people on the phone on a weekly basis, we were able to successfully recommend additional uses of the funds, which allowed us as a city to use the full allocation of the $1.2 million last year that was allocated to us. Um, in addition, we implemented procedures around COVID-19 related expense tracking and here I have to give a shout out to the art center staff, specifically Heidi as well as Bailey, who helped with those efforts and it was tedious work and a lot of information that we had to provide. So thank you so much again to, uh, for, for the efforts. Finally, we enrolled in the sales uh, state sales and use tax portal um, and I will again give an update on that a little bit later. And uh, we evaluated and developed an RFP for external audit services with the help of the audit committee, uh, which was recommended to council. And we have onboarded the new firm at the end of last year, and we're currently working with them um, on finishing out the 2020 audit. Slide please. So for 2021, and we can already check off a couple of those items. Uh, one of the items is developing a 15 year projections for revenues, expenditures and capital needs. So looking out 15 years and incorporating the development on the east side and uh, seeing how uh, expenditures and revenues are behaving and that information has already been shared with council. We are looking at developing an internal budget policy document to assist just staff with clear guidance around uh, guidance against and goals of the budget development process each year. Um, then we're looking into developing policies and internal controls related to the single audit requirements. We did meet the threshold last year, 2020, for the single audit uh, due to receiving federal funds over $750,000. Um, so we already have put in place a manual for all staff in regards to federal awards and what procedures have to be followed and internal controls specifically developed for those. So that already has been rolled out to all staff and is being audited this year. And finally, I added this um, just last week to, to this presentation, we'll be identifying the uses of the American Rescue Plan Act funding. So if there's an allocation that is coming to the city on how can we use those funds. And as of now, they are somewhat mirroring the CARES Act funding um, uses as well. The addition for this plan is um, lost revenues. So we can compare 2020 to 2019 and any lost revenues we would be able to claim, which we, we have a substantial amount there. All right, slide please. Any questions before I move forward with? our outsourced audits. Anything, Council? No, nope. Thank, right. thanks, Uli. So I think it was last year, I believe, or 2019, the decision was made to use Revenue Recovery Group to perform our sales and use tax audits. 
um, I've been working with revenue recovery over the extensively over the last year. So they are not just performing audits, but they're a huge resource for us as well with just daily questions that come up around the code and interpretation of our code. Um, currently, revenue recovery represents 42 Colorado counties and municipalities. Um, some of the municipalities that I've talked to, some of them have internal audit functions that are complemented by revenue recovery. Um, and then I just wanted to note here that the audit specialists have an average um, experience of 15 years in the field, which I thought is noteworthy. So to give a quick overview of what this means for the city, on the next slide, please. We have so far um, engaged in 23 different audits. So 13 audits have been completed to date, 10 are still ongoing. Of the completed audits, we had six audits with no findings. So what the auditors do in their process, they take a look at the business, ask for samples in certain periods and see if there's any systemic issues. If there isn't, we wouldn't go further with, with those audits. If they do identify any weaknesses, then we give them the okay to move forward on those audits. So we had seven with findings. Once uh, the audit is complete, revenue recovery provides us with all the work papers, and then the city issues the audit assessment to the business. And then we, at that point, work with the business to collect the funds. So net revenues, obviously there's a cost for revenue recovery by audit. The cost is being shared with Park Meadows for any of the businesses that are being audited in that area. They are also receiving a share back on the revenues that are recovered through the process. But um, looking at the revenues that are recovered, less any cost associated with revenue recovery, we're looking at a, a $45,000 positive area. And so it's paying more than paying for itself. Any questions? So when we find any, um I don't want to be as strong as saying something inappropriate or something that was, has been done wrong. Mm -hmm. So we're sending clear communication to the business like this is the appropriate way to handle this process. Where we did find some issues, were they the same issues? Is there some clarity to our process or some training or education that we could be offering to help the businesses uh, better understand the rules? There is some similarities, but it really depends on the type of business. So I think we're identifying certain businesses have issues in certain areas. So I think there's definitely uh, room to analyze at one point what is going on and how can we provide additional information uh, to, to the different areas. And we're starting this year already of identifying one area on where we've seen some uh, deficiencies and putting together some um, communication that we can then provide to that type of those types of businesses to support that's, them. That's great. I think kind of lessons learned that we can then give them because I think everybody wants to do the right thing. They understand the rules, they'll follow the rules. So yeah, and then that's our approach typically yep. too, is we want to teach and educate versus um, yep. Yep. Them yep. later anything on. else from council? No, no. OK, that was, that was where you were. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Slide, Thanks. please. So switching gears to the state health and use tax system, and I'll keep this very brief. Uh, Council has been educated on this topic multiple times. Our deputy city manager, Kristen Baumgartner, was part of the use tax simplification task force. It's quite a mouthful. I'll call it such. Um, and really the point here was um, you know, navigating for businesses, navigating our Colorado landscape in terms of sales and use tax. Uh, collection and submitted submittance with 70 home rule jurisdictions that can establish their own tax base and then they require the businesses to file with the individual units and get licensed with the different mun municipalities so really here we are targeting the marketplace facilitators um, and the the product that has come out of this is it, in my mind fantastic it's it's still in the early stages somewhat early stages so there's a few bumps in the road that we're working through with the Department of Revenue. We, we, we meet on a monthly basis to discuss any challenges and there's a commitment from, from their end to make improvements to the process. 
But the system currently has two primary components. One, the portal where the business files their taxes. So they go onto the system, file the tax return and submit the payment and the payment uh, gets funneled directly to us. And they can do, they can submit taxes off of one spreadsheet for all the different municipalities that are enrolled in the system. So it makes it much, much easier. And that was the intent on, on their end. And this system is coupled with a geographic information system, a GIS system that is um, the vendor that was chosen there is TTR. And that system is um, helping businesses to identify, can enter an address in the system, what tax rate that do you have to charge, which jurisdiction do you have to submit the tax to, as well as it's outlining the different um, exemptions as well. Next slide, please. So a couple of informational slides here, um, just the rollout of who has enrolled in the system in terms of the home rule municipalities. So as of the beginning of March, 48 home rules have enrolled in SUTS, which represents 69%. So I think that is, that is a great success and I think that is growing too as well. On the next slide, we're looking at how many businesses have registered through the set. So how many businesses have registered and now are submitting tax returns through the system? And on our status call this morning, they updated the number for March. So we're currently at 6,100 businesses, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So on the next slide, we're just looking at what does it mean for the city of Laundry? So we onboarded in September uh, of last year. 69 different businesses have submitted tax returns as of the end of last month through SUTS. The interesting and exciting part here is when we analyzed that to our current business list that we had in our system, there was only a handful of businesses that transitioned from our system to SUTS. So these are new dollars that are coming to the city that we would not have been able to capture prior to that. And the total dollar amount submitted so far is around $14,000, but I suspect that that number will be growing over time as well. All right, next slide, please. Any questions before I dive into the 2020 year and financial? Yes, when? Uh, I do have one. Uh, what is the lag time between um, when uh, these businesses create the tax and it is remitted to the city? It's about up to 10 days. Okay. Um, most of them we've been seeing uh, coming through faster. It depends on their payment method as well. Okay. But yeah, once it gets cleared and then it gets funneled out, um, I think the guarantee was that it would be less than 10 days. Great. Yeah. Anything, Mike? Do you have a sense of whether SUS is paying for itself? The cost of the system, the cost of implementation. I mean, is if, there a sufficient tax generation? Yeah, I think if you look municipality wide, um, most of the municipalities have shared that they have seen they have been seeing at this point one to two percent of their revenues coming through the system. And again, those are new revenues to to most of them that they've seen. I've not seen any hard dollars compared to the implementation cost, but I would suspect once the system matures, it would absolutely pay for itself. Anything else? No, I think I think it's wonderful and it hats off to Kristen for her good work in actually helping the state get this set up and running. So I think again, showing great leadership, but I think this will be an important revenue stream for the city moving forward as we see more and more folks uh, move to online shopping and more online retailers existing, but then also our population growing. Mm -hmm. And as we see folks on coming in on the east side and we and we grow, I think this will be a growing revenue stream for us versus a diminishing revenue stream which is what's happening with our traditional sales tax revenues. So I think it's good and exciting and it's it's fulfilling the, the kind of promise or the hope. So that's wonderful. Yeah, and we'll continue to um, yeah. present the data to you on a, on a regular basis. All right, starting with how did we end 2020? Yeah. What, what a crazy year. Um, I did want to bring up this slide first to just set the tone. You've seen this chart multiple times, but this is now the complete picture of January through December 2020 data compared to 2019 data. Um, and then I did add our projections down in orange, reddish, <laughs> below, uh, just to, to compare. So what I wanted to point out first is we have our sales, use, lodging, and admissions tax and our total tax column. 
the total tax column, you can see that the big impact coming March, April and May. And that's when we started with our projections. So our first projections we developed in March, the finalized ones, I think we um, were dated May 4th. So that's the time frame we predicted how, how the year would end. I'm looking down the third quarter looked a little bit better with some of the restrictions being um, relieved, I guess. Um, but then we, we saw again a bigger impact in Q4 of last year. So I was very grateful that um, we did take a conservative approach around the forecasting, especially when we saw numbers coming in for November and then December. Um, and, and the conservative approach, I think, did pay off in the end, still looking at seven million, I mean, seven million dollars less than 2019. I mean, that's a major, major impact, obviously, on our budget. But even comparing our projections to the actuals, we were slightly off on the um, sales tax. We were right on point on our use tax, right on point with our lodging tax and uh, slightly off in admissions tax, even though that dollar amount is it's relatively small. So I think overall, um, again, I think it served us well to take the conservative approach. So with that said, um, it's still sobering to see a slide like this with all of these significant negative numbers. <laughs> and I think uh, it is um, something we probably never would have anticipated experiencing in the city of Lone Tree. And I think this is a telling slide. Yeah, as, as good a job as we you did and that the team did in identifying that we were going to be down. I think uh, it's it's still, when I saw these numbers, again, sobering, so. Yeah, it's hard to put a positive spin. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Well, I, I would just say that the positive spin is you, you can't make the many decisions that we had to make without a really good forecast. Right. And our ability, which at the time when I saw the first sets of the forecast, I thought they right. were great, like there's no way it's going to be that bad. Um, and it turns out you guys were really spot on with the forecast, which allowed us to make decisions quickly and with a lot of, uh, you know, um, under a, a very stressful time. So kudos to you guys for what you pulled off in that time. Thank you. So the next slide. Yeah, get rid of those negative numbers. <laughs> <laughs> we're yeah. switching to positive numbers now. And, and now we're really comparing our amended budget, right, or our estimates on how we would end the year to how they actually came in. So in regards to revenue, we came in $2.2 million higher than what we estimated. And there's a, a few sources on, on where those variances are coming from. The majority is coming from that sales tax that we just looked at, that variance between what we projected to what actually came in. Um, but then we saw steady and uh, revenue streams from construction related revenues, which construction didn't seem to be affected by, by this pandemic or not as much. It definitely did not show on, on the um, revenues. And then we did um, we did have a amount allocated for the CARES Act funding, but not the full $1.2 million. We took a little bit of a conservative approach there as well, just because there was a lot of uncertainty on what can be claimed uh, versus what actually got approved. Uh, so that actually helped as well with, with that positive variance. On the expenditure side, we came in $1.2 million below what we estimated. And you have to give kudos to all of the departments. All of our departments, when we look at different line items, were very, very, very cautious around their budget this, this entire year. And I look at the departments right now. Um, and then combined with there as well, we put somewhat of a contingency in for CARES Act related expenditures, not knowing what we may have to spend money on. Uh, so both of those items really contributed towards that $1.2 million, which results in a positive um, fund balance compared to what we estimated of $3.4 million. Again, $3.4 million looking at, again, back to our total impact on the budget. Um, not, not great news, but we ended positive. So, so we'll take that. Right. Even though we have our amended budget, we are still significantly down from our original budget in the revenue, you know, area. But we were conservative, which allowed us again to end the year slightly better than what we thought. Less bad. That's a good way. I like that. 
our insight, please. So what does this ending balance now mean for our 2021 budget? Um, looking at the 2021 operating budget, we will continue to operate on the austerity budget that was developed for 2021. Nothing is changing in, in terms of that. The 2021 budget also included the use of the working reserve about for about one and a half million dollars. So with this excess fund balance, we would be able to um, offset the usage of the working reserve for 2021, which is that that is exciting news. On the next slide, we're looking at the impact on our capital budget and it, it, this message looks slightly different, unfortunately. So I just wanted to remind Council here that in 2020, as well as in 2021, we had about $4 million of capital projects that we could not fund. So those were not included in, in the budget. So those will be deferred to future years. There's still a need to get those done at one point. We also did not budget for any contributions towards the capital reserve, neither in 2020 or in 2021. So what was included in the 2021 budget is just minimal approved capital projects, which we were able to recommend due to the support from our funding partners. So those funding dollars from our partners were very, very important. And it included the usage of the capital reserve by uh, of about $2.8 million. So a significant impact there. So this excess 2020 excess fund balance can help us to partially offset the usage of our capital reserve, but we will still have to dip into that quite significantly. Um, it's somewhat rolling down the cane right as well. We have deferred capital projects from two years now that that have not been completed. So we will have to look at our five year capital plan and reevaluate priorities over the next years um, just because those these two years have they do have a significant impact on our next five years and, and how we uh, prioritize and evaluate. Any questions about this? I think it's important to note I mean, what you said. So not only were, did we defer almost $4 million of capital, we also didn't put any money into the capital, which typically every year a portion of our revenue stream does go in to fund capital reserves. So it's almost like we were hit twice. And I do think as we look out for our next year, uh, the, excuse me, as a five-year capital plan moving forward, I think we are going to have to um, start looking realistically about how much we will be able to contribute to that moving forward. And are we going to be able to accomplish what historically we have been able to accomplish in the city of Lone Tree? Um, you know, the world is changing and, and uh, every indication is these changes, uh, not all, but some of them will be permanent changes, I think, affecting real revenue streams for us. So um, I know Council shares my concern about getting behind on infrastructure uh, maintenance projects because they cost more <laughs> in the end. So uh, I think it's important that that is highlighted. Great. All right, Anybody on the next else thoughts? No, okay, thanks. The next slide, um, this is just a, a small uh, portion of our working reserve policy, but what I wanted to highlight here is the policy calls out then that if we if we use the working reserve or when the working reserve is utilized, that the city prioritizes the replenishment of the working reserve as soon as revenues are available. And we do have access and excess fund balance as of 2000, 2020 excess fund balance. So reading this reserve, I think it would make sense. And I think it was in the interest of this policy to replenish the, the, the usage that we plan for this year. However, when we go to the next slide, there's a, not a contradiction, but um, maybe we just need some clarifying language. Our capital reserve policy is talking about if the city has any excess funding at the end of the year, uh, any unanticipated accumulated fund balance would be moved into the capital reserve. So here I'm seeking council's advice and guidance. Um, I think, again, the working res reserve policy is being intended that if it's being used, it should be replenished as soon as revenues are available. Um, so we, a proposed addition to the capital reserve could be just adding this last sentence, unless such access, access funds are required to replenish the working reserve for anticipated and authorized, authorized uses. So we would first 
bring the working reserve balance back up to to the 25 percent level and then the excess funds would be transferred over to the capital reserve so the, just to add some clarifying language so there's two two council adopted policies that seem to somewhat conflict with each other right now. Since I was seated at the council table when we adopted those policies, I don't think we ever envisioned yeah. having to replenish our working <clears throat> reserve. I don't think we ever envisioned a scenario where we'd be dipping into that reserve. Unfortunately, 2020 presented us with cascading challenges. That would be one of them. So I think what the direction we're going to we're hearing from staff is that we need to change our council adopted policy on our capital reserve right that's correct okay so these this this proposed additional language would go into our capital reserve policy that is correct. okay yeah because the right. working reserve policy seems very clear around right. this intention right so any questions no, that makes sense. on that from council no, makes okay. sense that we would prioritize the working before the capital and Correct. Hope that never happens and, again. Yeah, and pray that never happens again. But <laughs> yeah. yes, uh, yeah. So um, good catch by staff. Yes. Right. So on the next slide, in terms of next steps, is um, staff would recommend to add this clarifying language to the capital reserve policy, um, and then present it to council on April six for consideration for approval, mm -hmm. um, unless there's any concerns. My concern is it never happened again, but I don't think <laughs> you can't like, control that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I unfortunately have no magic wand. Yeah. So anybody have any and, and I'm assuming the language that is in the working reserve is consistent and, and does not need to be changed. That's correct. Okay, any questions from council on this one? No. All right. Well, I think it's important to keep our priorities clear in yeah. our working reserve accounts, particularly as we move forward in 2020. 2021 with the engagement process, the public will expect to, us to be clear in stating what our policies are and whether or not we've had to make any adjustments due to the significant revenue shortfalls during 2020. Right. And we, I think we need to be very clear in terms of our messaging on those reserves. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. With that, my last slide is comes to questions. Yeah, which we've been peppering you with the entire time, <laughs> as we do, as we do. So are there questions that we did not ask? No. Lily, great job. And I think uh, you've spent a lot more time with council than you ever anticipated in 2020. But um, I think Kathy said it really well in uh, the great work that you and your team have done supporting uh, not just the budgeting process, but all the departments as they worked through the very, very challenging year of, that was 2020 and the additional responsibilities of working through the CARES dollars and the support and uh, collaboration with our county partners as well. So I think those forecasts g gave us really um, credible numbers to work with as we made our decisions. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you for that. And don't ever do it again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Uli. Thank you so much. OK, thanks. Moving on now uh, to a discussion of sustainability standards and enhanced development options related to the zoning code update and Jennifer Drybread, our planning manager, is presenting in person and it's wonderful to see you, Jennifer. We're very happy. We're very happy and very interested in this topic. Good evening, Mayor and Council. It's good to see you all in person. It's really wonderful. Yeah. So it's been a long time. So yes, this is a topic hopefully of interest uh, to council as it has been to staff. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, um, next slide please, a little bit of the background. You might remember that um, Community Development Director Kelly First came before you a few weeks ago and said we'd like to begin an update to our zoning code and the, particularly the site improvement plan chapter and then as well as our design guidelines and standards. and. Um, uh, so she provided that being sort of the first phase of the zoning code update and uh, the process obviously in, entails you know researching and drafting and outreach and study sessions and referral process and public hearing and so on the whole goal and objective of this first phase one of the update is to have this come before council and be approved in the fall by the fall. 
So a little bit about uh, the purpose, um, you know, for coming before you tonight is uh, to discuss advancing the city's big ideas, goals, and policies related to sustainability and community uh, cohesion. Next slide, please. So sustainability has always been inherent in how the city grows, how it does business, and it's in the culture of the Lone Tree community from the city comprehensive plan to the 2018 International Energy Conservation Code, zoning code and design guidelines. We already require and encourage elements of green building and sustainable practices for our built environment. Increasingly, businesses and builders are using sustainable practices because technology and markets have advanced to make things more affordable and because this is what customers and employees have come to expect. That said, given the city's goals, we think we can incorporate more specific things that would advance sustainability in ways that still offers choice for developers. So in looking at this slide, um, these are some examples of voluntary uh, sustainable development in Lone Tree. In the upper left uh, portion of the slide, you'll see those are the uh, Thrive townhomes across from the library. Um, those came in highly efficient and included all rooftop solar for the entire development. Um, to the lower left corner is the uh, Charles Schwab uh, campus. And of course they incorporated a um, vegetated roof, um, which you know, vegetated roofs help to reduce stormwater impacts, reduce urban heat, heat island effect, insulates the building, reduces greenhouse gas emissions, and extends work <coughs> life. So a lot of really good uh, benefits there. Um, and then the upper right-hand corner is the Marriott Town Suites, and they incorporated a bike station for their patrons and for uh, the traveling public. And then finally, lower right-hand corner is the building that we're in right now, the Art Center, and um, that was obviously designed to meet LEED certification, so the city has been a leader in that as well. Next slide, please. So the discussion tonight is on concepts to enhance sustainability and community cohesion tied to the site improvement plan process. We're hoping to get initial council feedback now and prior to what would require additional researching and drafting, we really want your input early in the process on this topic. Next slide. So this concept um, includes, or this, this proposal really includes two concepts. Um, one being a short list of new requirements for site improvement plan applications centered largely around efficiency. Um, and then we'll get to the enhanced development menu that you saw in your packet, which is a little different program. So here, um, the uh, four areas that we've been looking at to that are, you know, we view as somewhat low cost uh, requirements here um, include a minimum number of elect, um, electric vehicle charging stations, installing conduit to allow for rooftop solar, sizing trash enclosures to accommodate recycling, and requiring exterior LED light fixtures. So an important thing to note here is that the requirements that we're talking about tonight in this program are above and beyond what are is currently required through the site improvement plan process or the zoning code or the building code. So we're looking at sort of taking it to that next level. Uh, next slide, please. So the second concept is establishing a menu of options called uh, Enhanced Development Menu, or EDM, I'll refer to it tonight, that developers may choose from for SIP approval. So um, this is an idea that staff came up with in looking at this update to the zoning code and knowing that sustainability is an important topic here in the Lone Tree community. And we thought, well, what about having a menu of things that developers could choose from? Lo and behold, we, I, we did some research and found out other communities in the region are actually doing this very thing. And they've called it, in a couple of cases, in the case of the city of Golden and the city of Lakewood, they actually have what's called an enhanced development menu. And um, so if we established a menu similar to that, it, or at least called it that, 
it would include things different from somewhat may include some of the same things that other communities have done in the region, but we would really tailor it to fit the Lone Tree needs and desires and goals. So um, the three categories that we looked at in titling category one is energy, water, and the built environment. Category two is transportation. And category three gets to a topic, not as much sustainability related, but called community cohesion and housing. And then another uh, other category, if you will. So um, the uh, other category is provides developers another option, and that is um, to propose their own ideas around these categories or as a substitute achieves, achieve silver lead certification or certification from an equivalent program. So um, those are an options. And this talks also on the slide, the last bullet says that uh, a tiered system is being considered. When we sent out the packet that council had for your review, you saw that we incorporated in there a 20,000 square foot minimum where these would apply. We got that from Lakewood. But then in discussing it more with our staff, we're like, well, what about the smaller you know, businesses? Should they also have some, you know, piece of the game or some part in this whole issue of sustainability. And so Roshana Floyd from our office said, what if we based it based on size instead of, and, and really look at it accordingly um, that way. And so next slide please, um, came up with a tiered system. And again, this is just, you know, hasn't seen the light of day here other than council tonight, but we're looking at here the concept of a four tier system where tier one would be uh, buildings that were 30,000 square foot or larger that could help capture the big box, the large office and multifamily. They perhaps would be required to choose from those categories from that menu six EDM items. Tier two in the 10,000 to 30,000 square foot size, which includes um, you know, stores like Trader Joe's, which are in the 12 to 15K range, and most DSW shoe stores um, are about 25,000 square foot. So this span would capture most traditional base stores and retailers, obviously not the big, big grocery stores, but those perhaps might have a requirement to choose four EDM items. Tier three in the 2,000 to 10,000 square foot range, two EDM items, and then less than 2,000, perhaps one. So what we're trying to do is find a way to try to be fair um, and sort of meet the need. So next slide, please. So here's how this would work. An applicant calls us, They're, they've expressed an interest in developing in the city of Lone Tree. Again, if it's single family, attached, multifamily or commercial development, those are the only three that require SIP approval. This would not apply to single family detached development, important to note that. Um, then staff would direct them to the city's guiding documents and requirements on our website and talk to them about what's required. With regard to EDM, the applicant would choose, again, among a menu of items um, from those three categories, what we discussed previously, next slide. And I'm not suggesting that you be able to read this, but just get an <laughs> idea that this is what a menu might look like. This is actually scaled down a little bit to fit the screen. Um, and it's just a parcel, a partial list. Um, the, uh, the, the full list that we were looking at initially was in your packet. You had an opportunity to read that. So how could this work? Hypothetically, a multifamily development comes in. It meets a scale, say the larger size, um, and they would look at, you know, perhaps choosing from category one, all Energy Star or equivalent outdoor lighting fixtures and designing and installing all low water plant materials. From category two, installing bike amenities and spaces for car share. From category three, neighborhood meeting space and public art. So th that gives you an idea of how that might be accomplished. 
when they submit their application, they would include their narrative and their plans would demonstrate how they've met the minimum EDM requirements. Next slide, please. Or the applicant wants to propose an optional item or items for consideration. So in that case, they'd provide a description, cost estimate, and alignment with how it meets the goals of enhancing community in the realm of sustainability and community cohesion above, again, above and beyond what's required now by the code, including the building code. Or they can propose to achieve lead silver or another program as approved by council. And in that case, it would waive all of the EDM requirements. They would meet it simply by coming in with silver uh, lead status, for example. We looked at you know, what is this impact on affordable housing? We all know that's an issue of real interest to council. Obviously, you want to keep the cost down low for um, affordable uh, housing developments. And interestingly, when we, you know, have met with uh, Cobalt on the affordable housing development there next to Ridgegate Station, they were required to go through to achieve that federal funding, CDBG and um, I don't think the home or Chaffa funds to go through a green enterprise system, um, which required them to be very mindful of sustainability. And so in this case, staff would recommend that they would not have to apply with the EDM requirements as well. Next slide. So should council direct staff to move forward uh, additional research and discussion is needed to refine the menu items. I think it's important for council to know this is an iterative process. One thing we learned uh, that I learned in talking with folks from the uh, city of Lakewood and city of Golden is the city of Golden has had this in place for 20 years and they said they've made several amendments over the years to their regulations and requirements. Changes in technology um, are a big, big reason. Um, and just changes to the building code that might make things that used to not be required now are required. So again, this is for things above and beyond. So, and then the keys to success, um, we, we believe, and um, in looking at other developments and programs throughout the region, the keys to success are support, obviously by council, by the development community and others, a manageable menu, flexibility in the process, providing choice, and that the program can be implemented. Next slide, please. So finally, um, some of the uh, potential impacts and benefits that staff sees in advancing this forward. Certainly potential impacts is there's an upfront investment by the development community in these items. So these aren't free. We're not stating that they are, but um, we'll get to the potential benefits that also kind of addresses that. There would be added staff work time, although we feel like with this process, sort of pick from each of the categories, it would not require an inordinate amount of staff time to really administer this program. Some potential bene uh, benefits include with an initial investment, businesses could receive savings over the long term and increased value. So, Yes, they pay to install. They maybe choose to install rooftop solar. Obviously, they have less energy costs. Um, perhaps they choose glazing efficiency, higher glazing efficiency. Same thing, reduction in energy costs. Maybe they choose energy star roofing. Same thing. Maybe they choose all low water demand plant materials. And don't think that that means cactus <laughs> and, and zero scape with rock. Um, I just spent quite a few months designing my uh, garden and it's all low water plant materials and it's going to be beautiful. So there really is a lot of good design and good plant materials to choose from while still keeping a low water demand. And I know that in talking with um, folks from uh, Ridgegate and Shea Homes, they're very mindful of water because Parker Water and Sanitation District they charge a lot for water, so they're very mindful on cutting back on what they can do to make it more cost effective. So other potential benefits, obviously this would take the city to the next level in sustainability and community enhancement, 
enhancements and can be accommodated, we believe, through our SIP process. Next slide, please. So final slide here is what we're looking for is your uh, questions and feedback. What do you like? Items that you have concerns with? You know, in the end, what we're looking for is are you generally supportive of this approach? So with that, I'll ask for any questions or input from council. Thanks, Jennifer. So I, um, I would like to actually have this discussion in two places. So there are some things that you talked about, new sustainability requirements that would just be part of our SIP process. And so there's a list of four bulleted items that you identified there for us. I think to me that's a different conversation than do we want to go above and beyond. So, um, so let, can we, uh, and I think this is going to be, I'm just going to get, I think this is going to be a two study session item for us, in my opinion. I think given what we've got tonight, uh, the rest of our agenda. So I guess I want to turn it over to council first for immediate thoughts, reactions. But let's let's as you as you give those reactions, think about things we may want to be including as part of our process and an update of what things we ex we would like to see on sustainability in the new code. I, I certainly think we need to step up the EV piece of it, but um, but going above and beyond that, I think is going to be a longer conversation. So who would like to start? Well, I'll like, kick it off yeah. if you like. I, I am delighted that we're taking a look at this area and giving it some serious thought and trying to understand where others may be in terms of municipalities trying to move the dial in concert with uh, applicants that are trying to grow and build and um, make a profit as they do that one way or another. Uh, there are things in here that I, I think need further looking at, and I appreciate the process is going to be iterative, and we haven't made up our minds on some of it. Uh, I like the flexibility options, uh, and I think that to the extent that where we're going is goal orientated and not prescriptive, I think we're better off. I recognize that there'll be some prescriptive requirement in order for the department to look at it and have the dialogue and, and get things on the table and talked about. But to the extent that what we're really trying to achieve is reduction in energy demand, reduction in water usage, and not that we're trying to check off a box. So I, you know, just a concern about goal orientated and are we achieving what we want to do. A second input that I'd have in terms of as you're going through the process and and looking at what might be appropriate to include and not include uh, to put us in a better space. Um, there may be opportunities that we see as a city that are broader than what an applicant would see in his purview. Uh, and I'm thinking of things like solar farms, waste to energy facilities that need, would need to be looked at in a broader context. And so I, I would like whatever process we have in place would recognize that maybe sometimes the contribution is for a regional need as opposed to specific within the context of what we're building. Uh, and, and so maybe the concept of in lieu of and raising funds that could go towards regional sustainability projects might be something we could work into this and actually at least to consider that uh, if there's a way to do that but i love the i think it's worth the effort uh, the results in this area will be driven by technology and market and we just want to make sure that we're encouraging and that uh, um, the applicants know that we're serious about it and we want to continue to be on the front edge so that, that's my thought at this point in time. Kath? Yeah, I just had a couple thoughts. Um, first, I also like the menu approach. I really um, want us to be flexible with folks as they're going through um, their plans. And this topic in general solicits a lot of emotion about things, how sustainability is defined and what, what really qualifies and those kinds of things. So I like the, that approach to it. Um, for me, the things that were included as potential changes um, for all SIPs. Um, I feel like are 
things that are well underway and um, really acceptable in today's standards. None of them seemed on the edge of like stretching too far. So that's just my personal opinion, but I felt pretty comfortable with those. The only area that I would um, like gently like to probe a little bit when we get a little deeper is in category three. Um, some of that I struggle to connect with sustainability and, and how we are going to be defining sustainability as a larger topic. Things like public art for me, and even in some ways attainable housing, feel like conversations that are outside of sustainability in some ways and maybe handled in other places versus you know, when you talk about um, landscaping and, and how we do that based on water. Like some of it seems like a broad description. Someone placing art as a sustainability requirement for me does not um, that that's harder for me to kind of connect. That's all. And that's for me personally. That may be under the larger definitions acceptable in space, but that would be where I would be pushing on like true sustainability requirements around energy and water and um, those types of things make uh, make me more comfortable with the menu. I would just say that um, it wasn't intended to be just sustainability. It was intended to be sustainability and um, and you can certainly, you know, have your opinions on public art or whatever, and we should discuss those. Right. Um, but it was intended to be to meet two, two goals and objectives, not just sustainability. Um, and there are other communities out there that have brought in attainable housing as an element of their program, of their enhanced development um, menu. So we don't say sustainable menu; it's an enhanced development menu. So the idea. And you, you know, we can certainly discuss whether, and certainly it's up to council whether we go that route or not. Yeah, I think it's just the mixing of the things where I start to get like just uh, from a public outreach perspective and a public perception perspective. The mixing of those two things is interesting. So I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, but I just love to explore that a little bit more as we go through. And I, I think perhaps a discussion on enhanced development might, and what we want to consider. Uh, might be worthwhile just having council just maybe even a strategy session or discuss what what do we mean and what do we think we want to see in there because um, I think you've it, it is very thought provoking what you have presented and yeah. uh, and I think what we'd like to understand is is where is um, where are our partners where are the rest of the communities regarding these types of things you mentioned Lakewood and Golden to us um, this seems a lot further uh, to me from where we have been, and, and we've always been an incentive driven versus a requiring uh, community. So how does this feel to me? I, I, I'm still processing it very, mm -hmm. and I think I would benefit from more dialogue about it, but, but when? So you're kind of headed where I was, and, and when we started with the first four items, um, I, I had no objection except to the EV installation. I think we could easily require the wiring um, to that point and um, and kind of hear me out here. <laughs> so for the rest, I would love to offer um, you know uh, some sort of incentive for builders, developers to choose six or choose four or choose two rather than making them a requirement. I, I, I do think that builders will build what people want. And I do believe that, look at Thrive, for example. They did it without any kind of requirement and people who live there are happy to live there and they sold very quickly because there was a demand in the public to to uh, live in an efficient home um i i just I, I will say the place i lived before i came to lone tree was golden and uh what the prices of housing there have done compared to here um, are it's astounding. And, and part of that is because they have requirements. Lakewood has growth requirements or limits. And, and although 
you know, we want to do the right framework, I would rather see builders and developers do what's right. And employers, you know, nobody made Schwab do the lead certification. Or the uh, EV stations, right? With EV stations, but they knew that their employees would love what they were going to do. And, uh, and when it helps you as an employer to attract people to your business, you want to do the things that that attract them. Um, but I, but I don't necessarily want to make that decision for them. So I'm more along the lines of, you know, if they get two or four or six and they choose those, um, then maybe they have the right to say we earned Lone Tree's highest, um, you know, designation for sustainability or our our second tier or our first tier of sustainability um, and use that as a selling point as opposed to requiring them to do it. Yeah, it's 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 a good all good points. Um, I would say that um, it's tough to incentivize and the re here's the reason why and other communities may do that, but the uh, zoning code and the plan developments that we have in Lone Tree, take Ridgegate for example, that plan development, sky's the limit almost for building height and that's oftentimes an incentive for, mm -hmm. you know, less parking or just all these other things. Um, there's not a maximum FAR requirement for area ratio here in Lone Tree. Um, in, in Ridgegate, most of the uses are pretty broad in their PD. Mm -hmm. And so um, what do you give back? I guess I would question whether a plaque that says that they've met Lone Tree Gold, for example, would provide enough incentive to really move the dial. Um, I would also say that um, we have been, you know, increasing the gain to some extent through our building code. Um, and we have, we do have some requirements for xeriscaping. That's become kind of the norm in the mm -hmm. industry. Um, but this is, again, it's just whether or not the council wants to move it, take us to that next level. Um, so yeah. Jennifer, I think what the council would first like to, I would like to better understand is what are the market driven technologies that kind of are easy and kind of becoming acceptable? So I think, I don't know, remember one of our council members talked about that with our, with those, you know, the, the four bullets that you talked about new sustainability requirements to be included in the SIP. I think I would like to have an understanding of um, these seem very appropriate to me based on what is happening in the world today and not a huge expense. And it just seems like keeping up uh, to me. One of the comments I have that was trying to understand, um, I do think having the EV infrastructure is going to become increasingly important. I think we are looking at some greenhouse gas emission budgets and climate issues. I think that to me is something where um, depending, but it would be size related. So this, you know, much like your menu was size related, I would like to have an understanding of a ratio of size of square footage built to EV infrastructure requirements and maybe above a certain size of required, maybe below a certain size, it's the conduit that's required. But what about a hydrogen pump or filling station or whatever? I. I don't, I, well, to me, that's a market technology. That's to me is the technology and market there for that yet, not quite. But I do think the EV, and from what I understand, uh, state requirements are going to be, and potentially federal requirements, that having that amenity is becoming pretty commonplace when almost Definitely. like providing recycling services. Oh, I, I agree. So I don't think that that's a bridge too far and I'd like staff to come back with kind of a menu on um, based on size. So, you know, a smaller. But if every DSW has to put in a $300,000 charger. And I'm not suggesting that yet. I'm suggesting okay. I want to understand it. So before we, I think we need I to ed be educated before we make those decisions. Right. Right. I would make one 
point here, these would not apply to exist to SIP amendments for the most part. So someone comes in, DSW, they want to paint their building a different color. Right. They want to add awnings. They want to expand the size of the building, and it's not a big expansion. I should have mentioned that. These would not apply. If What we're looking at is if it's a major amendment, and we're working on defining that a little better through our code update, then perhaps it would apply. But um, this would not apply to um, the existing buildings here in Lone Tree, for example, um, or existing buildings elsewhere. <coughs> um, and I, I would also say that just, you know, as far as raising the cost of housing, these don't apply for housing. But you're right, there is an added expense that's, we have to be realistic. So again, getting back to the, I think the information that would help counsel in our decision making as we move forward. So in, in trying to just give you some some framework, I think trying to understand what markets, what the technology exists that would would drive forward, move forward the sustainability in the community without adding an undue burden and cost. I think that's important to understand. I, re I recall that uh, during the COBOL project, they talked about a certification that had to, and it was a required certification that and you mentioned a green build enterprise system. I'd like to understand, and I know they were talking about a multifamily housing product, and this would apply to multifamily, so it's not a single family detached. I'd like to understand what that menu looked like compared to this menu. Um, I, I know you, we've taken it potentially much further than that, um, but I think what is it that the developers are used to doing right now? What is becoming acceptable practices? Um, I think we do need to engage the business community before we get too far down the road. I think we are very concerned about adding costs and burdens to business. And so we don't, uh, there's a tension there that exists, right? We want to we want to encourage sustainability, but we do not want to overburden. And I can't tell you where that tension point right. is right now. And I think some dialogue with developers um, and some of the partners that are doing this work, perhaps it's Lakewood, Perhaps it's golden. Um, I think we all want to see us be good stewards of the environment, but I think there, again, the how it comes back to how much was it cost? And it's hard to make this judgment without a sense of, oh, gee, that's going to add X to a multifamily housing project, or even if it's a single family attached project, that's an expense. So uh, I think I need a better understanding of what sustainably means today. I think it's more than what we're asking in our SIP, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure that I'm ready to be able to go this far yet. I appreciate the menu option, love it. Yeah. I, I think the flexibility is gonna be key. I think uh, Mike raised an interesting point where, well, could you contribute dollars instead? Again, we're putting a burden on our businesses, but that's a worthwhile thing to take a look at. Um, so I would like to focus initially on updates to the SIP, and then I would love to explore this menu option. Um, you know, for example, the glazing efficiency and, you know, to the energy code, when is that going to happen anyway? I mean, is that going to be the next update uh, to the uh, energy code? It was done in 2018, I believe. How often do those update those? And is this going to encompass that standard or is this taking us beyond what's going to be required even in the next standard? Yeah, Matt uh, Archer and talking with him, our chief building official uh, knows someone who heads uh, through the um, Colorado Building Code chapter um, the whole issue on sustainability, energy, green codes, and all of that. So I've been waiting to find out if council wants us to proceed, even looking through that, before I gave her a call, because I think she's going to have a lot of those answers right. um, for us. So at the direction that the world is heading in, I think that's the direction we want to head in. Mm -hmm. I don't think we want to lead it but I think we want to keep up with it. I mean, and so to have an understanding of where the codes are going, I think would be beneficial as we look at this. So maybe there is maybe there is some incentive, Jennifer, and I'm not sure what it would be that we could provide if you do it sooner rather than later. And those are the types of things that I would like to explore. So this is going to be coming down the pipe anyway. Why don't you guys commit to doing it now? It's good for you. It's good for your consumer. It's good for the environment. And if you do that, 
I do want to explore some incentive we could give back. I appreciate that our flexibility in our zoning doesn't give us a lot, but um, maybe it's a parking requirement. Maybe with um, maybe so. But I want to understand where the industry is going on it. And I think the um, it's interesting. The category three to me, they the kind of the tensions that were brought or raised with COVID. Some of these speak to kind of creating that outdoor space, those areas where people who are in uh, more um, dense neighborhoods having these outdoor spaces to gather, to garden, to, I mean, I, I see value there, but I, I, it's the market too. So I don't know if we've given you enough direction, but to come back and I'd love to start again with the new sustainability requirements for the SIP approval. And then, yeah. um, uh, and I would love to have, uh, a, have staff start engaging with our, our um, municipal partners on what they're doing beyond just Golden and Bro and not Go mm -hmm. Golden and Lakewood, and also the development community. I mean, we've we've worked with a number of developers. Wynn made a great point as far as looking at um, uh, the, the community that kind of already did it without being required, and that just sold like hotcakes. And and from what I understand, Thrive may be considering development on the on the east side as well. And what I mean, I think they would be a great resource. So. You've made us think, Jennifer. I don't know that we're <laughs> quite there yet, but we want to learn more. Okay. So I think that's a good space to be in. That's great. We'll take it. Okay. Can All I, right. Can I make uh, yeah, one comment? Yeah, yeah. I, several years ago, I ended up at one of these I, IEEC or whatever they are meetings. Of course it, you did. It, <laughs> I know, really. But it, what was interesting is their question to the group was, how do we get municipal uh, compliance and adoption of the new rules. And my answer was, you make the consumer want it. And I think that's kind of my approach to this is, if we can find the things that consumers will want, then it it will be things that the builders are, are already thinking about. And we probably go about it by finding what the builders are thinking about, but or the consumers or the or the consumers. But anyway, just yeah, but some things like recycling and our multifamily oh, yeah. buildings, I kind of feel like we need to be doing that. Of so course. So come back to us. OK, we'll do. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your time. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. That was really great staff work. Um, all right. Next up is Sky Ridge Avenue Bridge Repair Update. Justin, what good news do you have for us? And the other thing is, Justin, did Dan Rains take a look at our transportation categories? He might have some input on other things that we could be doing uh, for the uh, enhanced development options. Did I skip one? Oh my gosh, I did. I'm sorry, Justin. I'm sorry. Thank you, guys. I, <laughs> my, my ex off was a, I was a little too aggressive with my exing and skipped you, Kelly. Apologies. So discussion of the proposed entertainment district overlay zone, our community development director. Thanks, Kelly. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. <laughs> I, I, I got us ahead. Keep us on us. Right? Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much, Mayor and Council, for having us tonight. Hopefully, this is um, more uh, food for thought yeah. for you this evening. It is a discussion item. We are not, you know, uh, asking for any type of specific action, but just to kind of plant a seed, something for you to think about and give us some feedback on. And that is a proposal that we have to um, enhance the uh, entertainment district by adding an overlay zone. Next slide, please. So tonight I'm just going to talk about what does that mean? What is an overlay zone? The purpose of that um, specifically for the entertainment district, um, some of the background problems that we're seeing uh, in that area to justify why we're looking at that space, um, the opportunities that are in that area as well, and then a potential framework for what that overlay zone might look like, and then of course your, your council comments and questions. So on the next slide, um, what is an overlay zone? This is a tool, uh, it's a regulatory tool, it's a land use based tool. It basically augments the underlying zoning of a property by either adding or creating alternative standards um, to address a certain goal. So 
as the name would suggest, it's on top of the existing um, zoning, which does not change. In other words, we're not um, diminishing, taking away any of the existing zoning rights by adding additional opportunities on top of it. Next slide, please. So specifically um, for the area that we're talking about tonight, it is the entertainment district uh, bound by Yosemite Street on the west, C470 on the north, um, and basically uh, the Heritage Hills um, community on the south uh, bounded here. And the reason for this is that this entire area, although it contains a lot of different types of uses, is under one zoning. It's, the, it's called the Westbrook Entertainment and Sports District Plan Development. So I'll refer to it tonight simply as the Entertainment District. Um, and next slide, please. And so the, the reason we're looking at this is because, you know, I think we all know this area has really kind of struggled over the past few years for a whole lot of different reasons. Um, as you know, we did an extensive public outreach in 2013 um, to re-envision the area. Um, and that, you know, we did make several public improvements, including signalization at Kimmer. We did uh, landscaping in Park Meadows Drive, of course, the Kimmer Plaza uh, open space and so forth. Um, the formation of the bid. So there have been some important improvements in that area, but unfortunately we just aren't seeing that private reinvestment in the area that we would, we would be hoping to have. So the purpose of this entertainment district overlay would be to really start to articulate a better vision for what we do want to see in the area. And we could do that by expanding and clarifying some of the land uses that are currently in the zoning, as well as um, talk about some of the processes and development standards. The idea is to really be proactive in helping to revitalize this area. Um, and we hope that the, the benefits would come not just to the businesses, but to the entire community as well. We want to support the existing businesses, but also attract those new ones and, and you know, create reinvestment redevelopment opportunities. So this overlay zone concept is really intended to be complementary to the things that you've been talking about over the last few months. Um, Jeff Hallwell and Kristen Baumgartner have brought you know, before you some different ideas concerning tax incentives. Um, the bid is going to be looking at some different improvements in this area. The common consumption ordinance, which is not specific to the entertainment district, but you know, will certainly benefit that area as well. And then, you know, along the lines of some of the SIP uh, issues that Jennifer just explained, all working together to again be proactive, find creative ways to really enhance these areas. Next slide, please. So again, going back to, I won't belabor this, but um, again. We've been trying to find ways to improve this area as early as 2013. Obviously, the pandemic has really exacerbated uh, the decline, uh, not just of this area, but um, other places. And so we really just want to try to reverse that. Um, and next slide, please. So specific to why the entertainment district, there are really some very specific challenges associated with this area. Um, that kind of differentiate it from just other places throughout the city. The zoning in particular is the big one. That, that is a 1998 county, Douglas County based zoning document that the city inherited. So it's quite outdated um, in terms of kind of what the uh, allowed uses are, the development pattern that it supports. Um, some of the terminology leads to ambiguity and interpretation and all sorts of things that we think could be clarified through this overlay approach. Um, additionally, there's about 130 acres total in the entertainment district. There are obviously uh, lots of different parcels uh, within it. So the fragmentation of all of this entire area makes it a little bit unique and difficult to really try to get things done as a whole to create placemaking, to create a, a unified brand. So that's a challenge. We obviously have multiple ownerships that we're dealing with here. There's a lack of a master developer that you might see in other shopping centers, for example, that can you know, try to bring together some common maintenance and improvements working on the bid uh, in that regard, obviously, but it doesn't apply to the entire entertainment district. The roadway network, um, you know, it's pretty auto centric through this area, creates a lot of um, barriers for pedestrian movement and so forth. Um, there's limited access and connections throughout this area. There's some undersized infrastructure. There's a lot of underground detention um, facilities within the entertainment district um, that tend to be a barrier for redevelopment in some, some areas. So that's something we'd want to look at. 
Obviously, there's some aging and um, defunct buildings that um, have been uh, slow to turn over or haven't uh, been occupied in the first place. And then overall, just this lack of a cohesive identity. Those are just some of the challenges that are specific to this area that we would like to address. Next slide, please. So I, I know you've seen the slide before, courtesy Jeff Hallwell in his um, presentations, but it speaks to you know some of the, the vacancies, the properties that we have in transition, properties that are up for sale or for lease. Um, so there's, there's quite a few, and this is probably yet to be updated even for um, today's um, challenged sites. So certainly a problem that um, we think uh, we need to try to reverse. Next slide, please. I'll go quickly through these. You've seen them before, just images of properties in transition. Next slide, please. Um, and we can just move through these. But as I said, you know, some of these uh, challenged properties are definitely, um, you know, we, we hope the best, but we don't want to take anything for granted. And we want to, um, you know, again, be kind of ahead of the game and how we can help reinvest uh, in these areas. Next slide, please. Long-term vacancies, obviously the TRIO and the Forstrom building have been a continuous challenge over the years. Next slide, please. And then, of course, COVID um, has affected a lot of our, our businesses as well. Next slide, please. So as many challenges as this area has, there's also opportunities. And um, we think the location of the entertainment district, right, um, being both at C470 and I-25, south of a regional um, shopping center, uh, you know, creates a lot of opportunities for this area, both regionally and then locally. You know, it's it's kind of the heart of the community in many ways, which is something we heard throughout the vision process. This has the potential to really be that place where residents and you know folks who work in Lone Tree can come um, and participate in kind of a common area. The multiple ownerships can be a good thing as well, right? It's not a sort of um, a development that's um, you know, just create it from scratch. It's something that's going to evolve over time. And those are some of the more authentic places that we see. So that's can also be a positive. Uh, there's lots of different uses in this space that we can capitalize on. And there's that central open space and trail access in the Kimmer Plaza. Um, the roadway network is something that we can improve upon and, you know, certainly not something that is insurmountable um, that we can't fix. Same with access and connectivity. And you know, there's a lot of redevelopment potential and a lot of interest. Um, I can attest that our planning division, I know Jeff Hall will get a lot of calls about redevelopment investment in this area. And so we wanna be able to answer those calls um, very specifically. Next question, please, or next slide, please. So there's three things really that we're suggesting tonight that could come out of an entertainment district overlay. And this again is kind of based on our collective experience over the years, things that we've been hearing from the development community and from um, the community at large. Um, and we think there's three components to this. Really the first one is establishing a clear vision. And this is something that we could build off of our comprehensive plan and the work of the vision plan that was done. And then, you know, assemble stakeholders as well as community outreach to really just check in and make sure um, we're articulating to people, what does the city want in this area? Because we get that question a lot. And unfortunately, we just don't have an updated plan or message that we can really give to people. So that would be step one. The second one would be to identify preferred land uses and um, you know, along the lines of the tax incentive ordinance that you looked at, we align you know, some of those uh, uses presumably with um, this type of an overlay. And with those, you know, folks might be able to take advantage of some special considerations if they're eligible to do that. And I'll, I'll get into those in just a second. And then the third one is to permit multifamily as an allowed use in limited areas. And I'm gonna get into that in just a little bit more detail. Next slide, please. So again, clear vision. Um, this is something that we would uh, certainly come back to council, probably involve planning commission stakeholders and others to really identify what that is building off of our comp plan and our vision book. Next slide, please. The idea behind preferred uses, again, you know, whatever those may be, whether it's um, revenue generating uses, restaurant, you know, whatever the case may be, if we identify those, um, they're 
probably already permitted by the zoning, what we could do to incentivize that is give things like expedited review of a development application, potentially look at you know, ways to you know, make it more affordable or doable by reducing parking requirements, for example. Um, there's some setback requirements currently that are um, you know, probably not conducive to the type of redevelopment that we'd like to see. So we'd be looking at potentially uh, reducing those in some areas. Alternative sign standards are another example of things that, you know, we hear a lot from businesses. Um, perhaps the overlay allows for a little bit more flexibility in sign allowances. Again, these are just examples of that concept. And then number three, next slide please, is the idea of introducing multifamily as an allowed use in uh, limited areas. We think that multifamily is a really critical ingredient to placemaking. And a lot of the successful places, the mixed use developments that um, you're all familiar with, um, Cherry Creek, Belmar, Streets of South Glen, you know, a, a key component of that is allowing for people to live there and support the businesses that are there and be able to walk to them. Um, residents can bring activity day and night, um, which businesses really like to see. Um, so I'm not suggesting that we, you know, open up the entertainment district to all multifamily, um, but uh, it is already, I should say, a, a, what we call a use by special review. So part of the problem today is people will call the city and say, hey, I'd like to do multifamily. And we're in a position of then saying, well, you have to go through this use by special review process. And it's kind of a rezoning process and there's a public hearing and there's a lot of uncertainty and risk associated with that, um, which is something that, you know, if council were receptive to this, we could eliminate that by allowing it as a permitted use. Uh, next slide, please. So what we would be suggesting would be to really introduce that in a place where it's going to have the most impact, a positive impact, which we think would be north of Park Meadows Drive. Um, so imagine you know, infill within that area, redevelopment that would incorporate, you know, a couple of multifamily projects. We could even limit the number of units just to make sure that we can still achieve a good balance. Um, but then, you know, making sure that if that were an allowed use, we would address more specifically building height, scale, massing, and things like that. Um, we could say you could do residential, but you're going to have to, you know, really provide these very strong connections um, to, you know, other businesses, to public spaces, things like that. Um, we could look at an alternative park dedication requirement for multifamily in that area because today the park requirement that would come into play for any project for residential is almost, um, it's its just unfeasible. Um, it's something that's in our subdivision code. It's a little bit outdated. It, it's based on the market value of land and it's really, again, just something that a lot of people can't do. Um, so again, what I'm suggesting is, you know, we could introduce multifamily. It actually gives the city a little bit more control than we have currently under this use by special review process because it would make it a permitted use, but with limitations within, you know, certain boundaries that, you know, you would all would, would be comfortable with. Um, and, you know, like I said, limiting it to certain areas would still maintain that overall mixed use flavor, which is what I think we're going for um, in the entertainment district as a whole. Next slide, please. So just in conclusion, you know, again, we talk about an overlay zone. We're really just talking about a tool that we can apply to the existing zoning of this area. It would be a way to proactively support reinvestment, revitalization for the entire community. Um, I'm suggesting that that framework could include a vision, um, preferred land uses, and the introduction of multifamily in a very limited area. Next slide, please. So should council want to explore this further, and that's why we're here tonight, to find out if this is even something you're interested in, um, we would certainly come back to you with a more specific proposal, um, involve stakeholders, involve the community. We would actually draft an ordinance. That's how this would get done, conduct public hearings and so on. Next slide, please. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions and take your initial input. Thanks. When, why don't you start? Oh, I'm so sorry. That's 
It's a nice ringtone. Yeah. <laughs> Pleasant. When you're old, it tells you to take a pill. Oh. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so, when go ahead. And I, I, I am concerned we're not going to probably have enough time to fully discuss this. So, give me your high level. Uh, yeah. I, overall, I like it. I, I feel like, um, as you had said, you know, it's more, um, you know, 1998 uh, type of, of concept, and, and that could be updated. Um, I I want to make sure if we do it that that it isn't kind of like just put apartment buildings to off to the side. But I'd love to see more like you mentioned, um, you know, retail downstairs, uh, residential upstairs. I there's a lot of uh, surface parking area. It seems like there's a lot of asphalt there. And um, it might be an appropriate area for a tiered parking structure. Um, I don't know, but um, I, I could see a different vision there. And if we can influence that, that's good. Mike. Uh, it's certainly an area that has opportunity. You know, as I listen to residents around the city, people ask me more about what's going on in the entertainment zone than any other question. So our residents know that it's not doing well and they don't support it. So um, I am all for putting tools in the basket. If a tool helps move the dial, I think that's great. I am not in favor of spending a lot of time revisioning. I think the visioning effort that was done was a good effort and I think the problem is more of putting a plan together to achieve the vision than it is revisioning. Right. So I, uh, I think there are some good questions that can be asked in terms of stakeholder interface. Yeah. How do we move to where to the vision? How do we get the business community to collectively come up with the funds to do the things that are going to make it a gathering place for people? And yet. So I, I see this as a tool that could help, but I don't think it's the solution to the problem. So uh, just so staff and council is clear, are you interested in continue to explore it though? But yeah. But yeah. I, I think the tool is being offered as a response to what you've heard from the business community, some things that might make them get a little more excited about developing. So I think that to, to go down that road helps. I think a lot more is needed. Yeah, Kathy. I think fundamentally the problem that we have there, what, what you're identifying is that the way in which it was distributed originally leaves it with just a whole bunch of individual developers. And so to get to that vision that where you can get a whole bunch of people to buy in is very, very difficult. So super in favor of anything that brings us to that, because I think that's what tries to get the, a solution that will work. As far as the multifamily, um, uh, we, I'm with Wynn that I, I like. I, I think that that is, um, and we're seeing it work in Bridgegate and other places where you can really mix. If there's a way that we can not force, but require mixed use as part of that, I'd be in favor of that. So we don't end up with, because we know there have been uh, folks uh, with opportunities to just do uh, multifamily in, in, um, in that region. And I'd like to see us um, maybe have a little bit more requirement around that. But I am interested, uh, like Mike, in the tool aspect of it more than a vision, because I'm not sure uh, unless um, Jeff can find a, you know, a really large scale developer to come in and kind of take over the region as a whole, where, where it's going to be pretty tough to sell a vision. So I love the idea of having zoning that's going to complement the tax incentive uh, program yep. that we just, uh, I think, and that's what I heard from council as well. I'm very concerned about the multifamily part of it. And even if we restricted it to the north side of Park Meadows, only in the sense that um, we, we have vacant retail on the bottom of existing multifamily in Ridgegate that has never leased has never ever leased, has never brought $1 of revenue to the city. 
So I just haven't seen it work. I haven't. I look at the streets of South Glen. Don't don't think that they're looking at redeveloping the streets of South Glen with that multifamily on the top and the retail on the bottom. I haven't seen it work. So and what I have heard from our residents is that they don't love the idea of another large scale multifamily. Now I really do balance that with I agree with the the comments that you, that you made, Kelly, as far as. Uh, housing creates a vibrancy and an activation of a space. Um, uh, but I also am very concerned about the traffic. I mean, Yosemite and Park Meadows Drive are very congested areas. I mean, how many multifamily, how many multifamily units do we have within a quarter of mile of where we're going to look to put more multifamily? Um, because there, that whole Park Meadows Drive is filled with multifamily apartments. Yeah. And uh, we heard loud and clear from residents when the zoning was changed to allow multifamily, uh, and it was under the county's purview that our residents didn't want that. So I, and and we have been approached multiple times by parcels to put multifamily in there, and I just feel like it's this easy solution. It'll turn the land over, but is it going to do anything to the benefit the existing community and the residents? So. I'm not saying no, I just have a lot of uh, reticence about the multifamily piece in that space and really understanding how it, other than, yeah, it'll, it, other than how it's gonna quite activate the space. I, even up in Ridgegate where, where there, there's a great mix of homes that are owned and multifamily that I think has activated the space. I think it's the institutional, uh, the library, the rec center, like those things are activating. Those are community at amenities that our residents use that activate the space. And the city has invested a lot of money in the visioning book and in the redesign of the roadway system, the construction of the park, the installation of the light and we haven't seen the business community step up to invest when so it's just i am i am struggling with it there is absolutely a need there i appreciate staff trying to be creative and trying to identify a solution so i don't want to say no but i do feel a lot more uh, i need to understand how the overlay district is really going to drive uh private investment in that area because I think we've seen the public investment side and how the traffic then is going to work um, on two congested roadways in our city. So and I and I do appreciate making it a more walkable place. We'll do that. Um, so yeah. so those are my comments for now. Uh, do you have clarifying questions you have of us? Um, no, I think great comments, um, all very well taken, and I think we can go back and have further discussion on where we might take this. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And take your pill. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Moving. Now it's your turn, Justin. Now it's your turn, and you have to be quick. <laughs> no. All right, so we are going to hear about our Sky Ridge Avenue bridge repair update. And Justin, we are very excited to learn what is happening. Yes, well, good evening, Mayor and members of City Council. So we are going to be presenting tonight on a quick update um, of our Sky Ridge Avenue bridge repair update. At the last meeting, Jacob Jays presented on all the uh, projects that Public Works is going to be working on in 2021. Again, he, I think, noted this was an unexpected project that has come yeah. um, into our team, but we are certainly uh, fully invested in this project uh, and working with our partners. But we wanted to provide a few more uh, detail to be able to provide the last study session. So with that, next slide. A little bit of this is repeat, but just so we can kind of understand the history. So, you know, um, I was driving I was driving into work and Mr. Fletcher calls me and says, hey, guess what? You need to come on I-25 right now. Um, so this was on February 18th of this year. We did... Uh, have an incident, a crash that occurred on the freeway that did strike the Sky Ridge Avenue bridge. At the time, it required a five hour closure of northbound I-25. Um, CDOT staff uh, was incredibly uh, uh, helpful to come on site. They did all the inspection work. You can see the crews in the photo here. They were up inspecting everything, making sure that it was safe to open the freeway, that the structure was safe, that all the, the critical safety functions could be met. Um, and that was done on that day. The next day, the city um, hired an additional inspection staff. We also visited the site. 
um, to do some additional work, review, and kind of assess the situation that existed. From there, um, you know, whenever an incident like this occurs on any um, structure anywhere in the state, right, uh, CDOT has an oversight of that process. Um, and they certainly let us know uh, via letter that we had major damage to a structure. Again, fairly obvious, we all saw that, but it was officially noted um, to us on the 18th. Uh, typically, those allow us 30 days to kind of develop a plan and a process to repair or replace that process, that um, girder or any other damage, and then to start the process of getting the construction. Again, that's really, really fast, right, in any kind of public infrastructure world. Uh, but again, that's why it's an emergency and a critical safety function. So our team has been working really hard the last 30 days, or technically 28 days. Um, we've been working with CDOT, FHWA, Lone Tree staff, our partners with Rampart Range Metro District, our consultant who we brought in, WSP, they were actually the original designers of this bridge, and the same designers are in town. They're all Denver local. Um, so that was a really good relationship we could just kind of continue to work with. Um, and many others. Uh, we've been meeting weekly, and we've mainly been discussing the inspection process, our design process, and our upcoming construction process. Uh, so again, this is not just the city of Lone Tree. We have had a lot of partners, including FHWA, has been in the, attending our meetings. And I just like to clarify that because this is kind of a regional project that sits over a major freeway, hence uh, the critical nature of this project. Um, finally, uh, the city of Lone Tree staff is working with CERSA and the insurance company um, from the truck that stuck to girder. Obviously, that's a process that's ongoing. I don't have a lot of information on that today, but that's an ongoing process. Next slide. So this is a super, uh, you know, this comes out of an engineering textbook uh, or engineering work, so you don't have to memorize this. But really what I'm trying to show here is when an incident like this happens, um, they sort of grade the damage that is done on a girder when it's struck, right? Because um, unfortunately, these things happen, right, um, with bridges over roadways. There's a, as you can see, a minor, moderate, and then they even get to severe, but they want to really clarify there's multiple levels of severe. A severe one, severe two, and a severe three. So this is what the teams were analyzing, what our design firm that we brought in was looking into, as well as our inspection team, as well as CDOT, was all kind of trying to judge what kind of damage do we see at this location, and that will help guide our path forward for what we need to do. So next slide. Um, so through that process and after the inspection and all that further analysis I mentioned, um, the girder on the Skyway Gemini Bridge uh, was classified as a severe three category. So again, when we think about that, right, unfortunately, you know, that is about as significant of a strike as you can have on a girder. Um, the photos, the damage we've seen, all of that wasn't a huge surprise, um, but we did want to do the analysis behind it to really understand was it that category or, or some other options. So based upon the rating that we just talked about um, and to ensure the serviceable life of this very new structure um, can remain in place, a full replacement of that girder is required. Um, you know, there's really not any type of repair option that is feasible that would allow this to become a 75 year lifespan bridge. You can imagine trying to um, repair some of that in any form really is not an option at that severe level three category. All right, next slide. So with that information, the city has been quickly moving forward um, to start some of these pieces in place. Uh, the first is we've been working uh, with a company called Encon. There's really two companies around the metro area that make girders um, of this scale. Um, and Encon had the forms, they had everything that we would need to be able to uh, procure this girder. Uh, they'd be able to make the exact one um, that we need. Uh, the design was provided, all that information. Um, CDOT also reviewed it and has assisted. And that was sent um, to them on March 12th, uh, which was just recently, March 12th, uh, for a total value you can see here of $66,967.28. Um, they are getting ready to start fabrication of that in the first week of April. Um, again, speed is absolutely critical to completing this process and having it move forward. Um, There's a lot of, um, you know, they were willing to work with us and understood the critical nature of this, and that's really where they put it in their schedule. Uh, they got a lot of the projects, but they did want to make sure they could fit uh, us in. Uh, the second piece of this 
Um, we are working on an emergency engineering design contract, again, with WSP. That was the original bridge designers and the team that worked on this bridge structure um, with our Rampart Range Metro District partners, as well as the city. Um, and currently, you can see that value on there, 239,107.24. Now, that is the max, right? That's kind of the maximum we would ever expect. Uh, sometimes we put that out there to make sure we can get all the work accomplished we would need to. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done to figure out exactly what scale of work has to be completed, um, but we absolutely know we have to get a design done. Um, and that was finalized as well on the 12th, um, and final contract execution is currently in process on that item. Next slide. So I know it's a lot of information, but really the, uh, some of our next steps that we are currently in process on right now, again, is to complete um, a design to replace the girder the deck, the sidewalk, and other associated work. Um, when you do this type of work, you have to do some extra, you can't just replace the girder. Obviously, you have to do a little work on the deck, the railing, some additional work to make sure you can remove what has to be removed, replace the girder, and then replace the rest of the bridge structure that works around it. Um, in addition, uh, we're beginning to work with CDOT on securing a contractor to complete the work. I'm gonna title it using their emergency contracting process. Uh, so CDOT does have an ability to really go out with a uh, sped up process for critical infrastructure projects. Um, the chief engineer at CDOT, the rest of the CDOT team has uh, been willing to allow us to, to use that process. Um, and we are currently working on that with them right now. In the next week or two, we'll have a little more updates on that that we can share. Um, but that is currently the process that we are in right now with CDOT. And uh, you know, again, I just want to highlight how much of a partner they've been through this process. Obviously critical for the seed hut as well, sitting over I-25, uh, but they continue to help guide, support, um, and really direct the city through this process. And uh, you know, I really want to make sure we appreciate that partnership that the state has provided. Next slide, that might. Yep. So last kind of next steps. Um, again, that girder fabrication will begin the first week of April. Um, the city and CDOT hope to have a contract in place uh, sort of in early April with the contractor to complete the girder replacement. We've already talked to our girder manufacturer. We will be transferring the PO, you know, with the purchase from us to the contractor once we bring them in place. So they would actually own the girder and, and move it to the site um, as we coordinate that. Um, but again, we wanted to start this process and get it built um, as soon as we could and before the local firms were busy on other projects. And finally, staff will begin uh, a proposed budget amendment for council consideration at our next council meeting on April 6th. Um, so that, with that, are there any questions on sort of the process um, or the program or anything that, that I can answer? Again, this is an evolving process. I will have a lot more information in the next few weeks and we'll be sharing again on the 6th. Okay, any burning questions? If not, we're gonna move on because uh, we, we're, we're hitting up tight here. So Justin, thank you for the update and uh, we look forward to learning the schedule on April 6th and the total costs. All right, uh, Thank you. with that uh, legislative update, Jeff Hallwell is presenting remotely. Uh, Jeff, can you hear us? Uh, we, I can hear you, Mary, can you see me? Yeah, we can see you Excellent. and uh, Jeff, apologies to make the, but asking you to make this as, as relevant and brief as possible. <laughs> well, you know, I, I uh, ha of course have a th th great to see you all council and, uh, uh, you um, know what the vo yeah. Jeff, hang on your Hi. volume okay. is way down. I don't know if okay. there's something we can do to help with that. Say something, say test, say test, 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 Jeff, Jeff. How about, can you hear me from this, uh, without my headset? Oh, that's uh, better, better, better. better. Go ahead, yell, just yell, Jeff. <laughs> just yell, okay. Well, uh, you know, thank you again, Mayor and Council. And uh, I can actually, pre uh, you know, uh, summarize this in about three different things and then forward the deck to you uh, um, after the meeting. Uh, Perfect. The, uh, the, the, of course, there are several bills that are affecting, you know, local government, uh, liquor laws, public safety, transportation, and uh, you're hearing about it in your uh, trade associations. The, the one that's uh, um, really hit, um, uh, the, the gotten a lot of people's attention is the Senate Bill 68, and, and that's called uh, a jail population management tools. It's uh, 62. 62. 62. Excuse me, I, I didn't have it right in front of me. Thank you, Mayor. Yes. And I can't even see uh, see you all either. I apologize. Um, but the uh, uh, what that does uh, is um, 
change a lot of statute around what is uh, uh, you know going to be uh, seen as a, a, a jail punishable offense. So it, it includes both felony and misdemeanor, and uh, it, there's a long laundry list of it. Uh, but what what has been uh, uh, part of the process is, is first it's it's been introduced by uh, Senator Pete Lee of uh, Colorado Springs, uh, who is has been pushing this uh, for several years. But his uh, his main objective is to, um, you know, of course, see you know the reduction in the, the cost and the, the population of uh, Colorado's penitentiaries. Uh, but the, you know, the ramifications, of course, are that uh, uh, lots of uh, Can you back up one. Sorry, Jeff, back up one slide. There you go. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. Jeff. Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> the ramifications, of course, are that a lot of the, uh, um, you know, the criminal activities that we're witnessing are no longer going to be um, punishable um, in a municipal court and district court and uh, state courts. Uh, the what's happened so far is that you know that there's been testimony at one committee hearing the, the Senate Judiciary Committee and it passed out of committee by a vote of three to two so it still has a long way to go and one of those uh, you know votes yes votes was the the bill sponsor himself uh, Senator Pete Lee uh, there has been wide uh, opinions about this as well there are um, groups uh, that uh, have surprisingly supported it. Uh, the Denver District Attorney, the Jefferson County District Attorney, several you know state district attorneys are in favor of it. Um, the the Colorado uh, uh, Sheriffs Association is neutral. Uh, Colorado Municipal League has has found himself in a position of uh, neutrality. Uh, but and then on the other cases, the uh, um, you know the merchants of downtown Boulder and the the, the uh, um, you know downtown business authority in Boulder is adamantly against it because of what uh, they experience uh, there as well. So there's a variety of opinions. I know Metro Mayor's Caucus talked about it a lot last week, and uh, uh, it's it's worth your um, uh, attention. And uh, would love to hear what you all think about it as well, Mayor. I know you had that conversation last week. Uh, please feel free so to chime. Thanks, Jeff. I think um, it, it was raised uh, a higher level with Metro mayors, and there are three major concerns with the bill. One, arrest standards. Evidently, you can have three failures to appear before you can get arrested. So you cannot show up, and then you commit you commit a crime. You get, you know, you're supposed to go. You don't go. You commit another crime. You don't go. You're supposed to go. You commit another crime, and that's when they can take you to jail. So as uh, as our chief explained it to me, somebody could steal my car, <laughs> take my purse, crash my car, and they would not be able to, to arrest and take that person to jail. So there's concerns about <laughs> the arrest standards. It, there's concerns about the authority of our courts. If you're issuing a warrant and it, it, nothing has happened, and there is uh, concerns about the bond and bond reform associated with it. From what I hear, some people are OK with the potential bond pieces of it, but not with the arrest standards and the challenge to the authority of our court system. I do think we need to understand more. CML's position, I think, has evolved. I heard from a uh, mayor today that they have um, introduced some potential uh, amendments, and they might be um, trying to walk that line of getting those amendments through. So um, the chief is concerned about it, uh, and um, I think it is something we need to make sure we're uh, using our voice at CML to, to uh, speak against. And it's my understanding that in the policy committee at CML, the, the only two votes that occurred, the majority said oppose, and the second group said oppose unless amended. And there was nobody that said to stay neutral on it. So there's some confusion about why they did move to the neutral position. Um, so again, I think we just do need to keep an eye on it. And I think that uh, it is on a slower track right now because there is so much concern um, over it. So th thanks for the update on that one, Jeff. Yeah, and and that thanks, is Mayor, as well. Uh, just two other quick things. I know you've probably been hearing uh, um, information about the Colorado Rescue Plan. Uh, yes. What it is is a series of uh, bills or you know, budget uh, amendments that the state will be taking on to address economic recovery in Colorado. Uh, I, uh, it's the second to last slide that we have here on the deck, and uh, it doesn't. Uh, it, the, the slide doesn't even include everything that's in it, but it, it gathered a lot of attention last week. It's a it's a process that the legislature and the governor are going to go through to you know, 
put a nice uh, bow around what they see as economic recovery. So it's not one single bill that we should be watching. There's going to be a lot of different things that will affect uh, you know, municipalities, our business community, um, arts and cultural organizations. There's even a proposal to incentivize events and conferences, and it'll come in a variety of different ways. And we'll keep our eye on it and keep you uh, informed about it, but it isn't one thing. Um, and it's going to all of them are going to come at uh, different intervals, but ultimately the, they'll, they'll want to put a bow around it on the end and uh, uh, call it the, the recovery plan. So uh, uh, that's about that on, on this topic. And then finally, the very last slide is the, the American Rescue Plan. You all know that uh, just last week President Biden signed it. In fact, I, I understand the vice president is here in Colorado today to uh, promote it. Uh, the big uh, uh, entity, you know, thing for local governments is the $350 billion designated for states, municipalities, and counties. And for the city of Lone Tree, uh, from the, the um, spreadsheet we see, uh, you know, going around, it, it's equal to $2.8 million that uh, will come to us in uh, probably a, a couple different ways. And uh, we're getting information on how that's going to happen. I don't, I don't think it's completely clear about where, how the money, the funds are distributed, but. Uh, Roughly 2.8 million for the city of Lone Tree, and uh, in addition to that, you know, it's not just the, our direct benefit, but uh, you know, $1,400 checks to individuals, roughly 60 million to the county, and uh, three, four billion to the state of Colorado. I think we're going to be seeing a lot of different programs, uh, locally or statewide, that uh, will impact us, our business community, um, or hopefully just uh, see new shoppers coming to Lone Tree that will help us as well. So a big deal and uh, we'll keep our eye on it for all of you all. So that's it for me, and uh, I'll send you the deck uh, after this meeting. Thank, thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. OK, next, the last thing is our consent agenda minutes of March 2nd from our regular meeting claims for February 23rd to March 8th, 2021, and our January 2021 treasurer's report. Are there any questions on consent? No. Nope. nope. All right, well, we will consider that at our council meeting at seven. OK, so we are this concludes our study session and uh, we uh, will take a break until we start a regular meeting at seven. So thanks everybody and thanks staff for going through. That was a lot. It's a lot of heavy lifting in study session. So 